Two. Would you like to meet the man that Menace's gang was, was trying to kill? The who was trying to kill? A man Menace's gang of people. <coughs> Charles. Um, in, well, maybe. I meet all kinds. I met you. Yeah. We're still talking. Yeah. That's a good sign. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably one of the most unique people you've ever met because I was trying to calculate what I was going to say today, but I used to calculate in my New York office that at least 25,000 writers a year would contact me in some way or another. Either I would meet them in a writer's conference, or they would call me on the phone, or I would get an email, uh, or a letter, or a submission. So I'd have to think about that, but I'm going to give it a maybe, because I really don't want to go down the road of crime and mayhem anymore in my life. I really want to be more about celebration and joy and happiness. Yeah. And now, it, you know, but that's interesting to me because of my connection to Bugliosi, yeah. et cetera. Yes, ma'am. This new venue of the spirituality celebration affecting the world, is that fiction, non-fiction, just, just excellent writing? <laughs> well, does it have an angel? Uh, nothing like that has an angel. Well, do you have angels? Okay. All right, well, that's a start. Um, it, there's really no rhyme or reason. It just has to be extraordinary. And you have to be really dedicated. And what's your name? Vanessa. Vanessa. Who is Vanessa? Because Vanessa has to become somebody in terms of New York publishing speak. Not so much in Hollywood. It doesn't matter who you are in Hollywood if I got a million dollar advance for you in New York. That's what matters in Hollywood because then we have a feeding frenzy. I wrote a book, and I'll give, you, uh, I'll give you an email address, and if anybody wants it, I'd be happy to send you an e-file of it. It's called Author Screenwriter. I'm gonna rewrite it. You can look up what people say about it on Amazon. I don't think it's even for sale on Amazon. Oh, you can get it from bnn.com, bnn.com. And I'm gonna rewrite the book, and if for some reason you bought it, when I rewrote it, I would give it to you for free. Um, I'm so consumed with my work that I don't have time to market myself because there's just so many minutes in every day. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed with extraordinary opportunities. Like this man wants me to meet the guy that Charlie Manson wanted to kill. I'm still echoing in my brain what that means, but huh. Charlie Manson didn't kill anybody. He had other people kill him. That's, and Vince prosecuted him for that, which was unprecedented for somebody to be prosecuted for murder that didn't actually commit the act. But he proved to the jury that he was responsible for those deaths and the Tate Lobianca murders. Yes? You said something about tax rebates in certain states that makes a, makes a deal more attractive. Um, what, what do you know about Hawaii in those terms? I don't know anything about Hawaii. Um, There's rebates. There's no rebates. What's the percentage? I can't tell you it changes every year. Right? Well, it changes. I made a movie a couple years ago called Kill the Irishman. It was based on a true story out of Cleveland about Danny Green, who was an Irish. Anybody know who Danny Green was? Ray Stevenson. Ray Stevenson? Good. I was the executive producer of that movie. It took me 12 years to get it made, but it turned out really good. Very good. Very good. Val Kilmer. Um, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio, Christopher Walken, Ray Stevenson, Robert Davi, who had a great cast. It was about the Irish mob versus the Italian mob in Cleveland in 1976. There were 36 car bombings in that city in that year. And what happened is they stole a container of C4 from the docks and they were blowing everybody up. So you'd start your car, boom! And it was a war between the Irish and the Italians. And um, we made that movie set in Cleveland in Detroit because we got a 42% tax rebate. So that was only a $7.2 million. They got the 42% back and the movie looks great. You can get it on Netflix. It's a, it's a tough movie.
A lot of people get beat up in it. But it's organic. It's not gratuitous. I don't like gratuitous violence anymore. Has anybody seen the new Quentin Tarantino movie? Django? Oh my God. I know people. Yeah, it was all necessary. Yeah. Well, it's a great movie, but it's, there's about 46 too, minutes too much of blood. Splattering on everything. What? Yeah, he does. I don't know. Uh, yes? When you have a, a book, whether it's fiction or real, and, uh, and it, it would be worthy of a movie, is it best to go to a screenwriter and say, hey, can you turn this into a movie, or try and do it yourself? <laughs> I mean, well, what's, that, or what's, what's that process? Well, that's, a, that's called adapting a book into a movie. So writing a book is called writing prose. The art of adapting prose into a movie is called dramaturgy, script writing. Okay. Um, many people have asked me this similar question. They want to write the script to their book. And in the instance of Hillary, she wrote a script, but she believes she could turn it into a novel. But it's not me sitting at the typewriter for 1,400 hours perfecting it. It's a lot of work writing a book and getting it perfect. But some people become just, they get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, have a cup of coffee, and at 1.30 they get away from the chair and they've got seven or eight pages. You know, if you can get seven or eight pages a day and you write for 30 days, that's a book, pretty much, if you've got that kind of stamina, that kind of peace, that kind of income, so you can do that. Uh, but that's the, the life of, a, of a, a writer. I know my butt is in the chair at least 10 hours a day, at least six days a week. <laughs> I can't stop working. But <laughs> that's what it takes. Um, excuse me, the lady in the back, have we ever met before? Possibly. You look familiar. Maybe one of the waterfalls. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think who you remind me of. Here, so. Okay. I, I've been to a few. I haven't been there lately. It's got to rain to have waterfalls. From Hana. Is, is it more like you take your, your book and you, your agent or you market it to the film people and then they go, oh, yeah, we like it, we'll take it, we'll adapt it, and you just kind of stay out and they, they uh, do the screenwriting? I mean, I'm just wondering how does that, how okay. do books well, it's always best that you sell your book first before you make your movie deal. Mario Puzo said, never sell the movie rights to your book until it's published. Now, of course, I think his first book was The Godfather, which I read before I went to see the movie, and it was, uh, it was powerful. Um, and how it works, assuming in my book, I tell the story of a woman that came to me a couple of years ago, she was 65, she'd never written a novel, she told me a story about how she had a cookie club in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and on the first Monday of every December, 12 women got together, they all bought 13 dozen cookies of the cookie that they liked, and they would give one, uh, uh, 12 dozen each away to people, poor people, hospice people, underprivileged people, orphanages, They'd spread cookie cheer around with Christmas cookies. And then they'd each sample the dozen. So the 12 girls would get in the room, they'd have cocktails, wine, and cookies, and chatter, and talk about what happened in their life the previous year. Births, marriages, people moving, death, injuries, murder, mayhem, abortions, everything that happened in 12 women's lives and how it extended. So I got that woman a million fifty thousand dollar advance on a two book deal in a heated auction. And that, I'm happy when I do stuff like that. And then I sold the movie rights. So this is for you. We had a frenzy going on. And Wendy Feinerman came into my life. She produced Forrest Gump, The Devil Wears Prada, powerful woman producer, Academy Award winning. And she said, I, I, I can make this movie. I said, okay. 
we went partners and we made a deal with CBS Films and they gave my client a $100,000 option and they paid Robert Harling $750,000 to adapt the screenplay. And as soon as he handed it in, they dropped the project. That's called development hell. They said the book didn't do well enough, it's a little soft. So that company is called CBS Films, it's not CBS Television, which is a division of CBS, which is run by Les Moonves, who's probably one of the most powerful people in Hollywood. Uh, they just dropped the project. But that's kind of what happens. You sell the book in New York, then you get producers interested in it, then you option it, and then they find a screenwriter. Now, Robert Harling, I think, won an Academy Award, win, uh, Academy Award for, um, oh, I can't think of the name, a Southern movie. It was based on a book, and uh, it just didn't work. And this has happened to me many times. I have a, a book that I set up at Warner Brothers 14 years ago called 1906. It's written by James D'Alessandro. We went to California, or to Los Angeles, and I had James with Steven Spielberg, James Cameron's office, um, Barry Levinson's office at Warner Brothers, uh, uh, I can't even, I, about seven or eight meetings. And, and that was in two days. At the end of the second day, I had a bidding war going on between Spielberg and Warner Brothers. And uh, we went with Warner Brothers against my better judgment. My clients don't always listen to me. Spielberg would have paid about 125,000 more in the deal and my client wanted to go with Warner Brothers because they thought they were gonna respect him as a screenwriter. And lo and behold, they did respect him and pay him the money, but they never talked to him. He never had a chance to fix the script. Development hell. That project, which I'm an executive producer on, I can't wait to get my check, which I may never get, because Hollywood is the only business in the world where you can die of anticipation. <laughs> so I hope you got something out of that, because it's not a finite science. Yes? Well, I'm not Mario Puzo, but the wisdom in that is that his first book was an enormous bestseller. So he, I don't know exactly when that went, maybe he got screwed. Maybe he sold the movie rights to The Godfather. I'd have to do a little research before it was a bestseller. Um, i.e. he may have gotten like $100,000 for the movie rights to an unpublished manuscript or 75,000 and then it became one of the most celebrated mob novels in the history of the world and he felt gypped. But then he wrote Casino and he may have written, he may have said that after The Godfather was published and produced as a movie or a trilogy and he may have also said that because in the deal making language of a contract for the motion picture or television rights to a book, they have a prequel and sequel rights clause. And the prequel is they only pay you a third of what they paid you for the original book. So, and a sequel, right, which is two and three, you only get a third. So he may have, may have been some deal, I mean, I'm inventing that, but I'm pro it's pr probably exactly what happened. You know what the difference between gross profit and net profit is? No profit. Yeah. The net profit definitions in Hollywood are toilet paper. Okay? It's crap. Now, now I've made profits on a couple of my films. They haven't been huge profits. I think two of the films that I've had made that I was a producer on, I got profits on, which were welcome. Um, so does that answer your question? Well, kind of, just invited another guest though. So when you do your deals, do you always try to go for gross, I mean, uh, gross receipts figure? Do you try to get at that, try to get above the line, I think you call it? Okay, that's a complicated okay. question. If you are a famous writer, if you're John Grisham, um, 
you can do a lot more in negotiation. If you're a baby author and you wrote a novel and I sell the movie rights to it, you're never going to get gross profits. Never. Unless you're financing the movie or something because unless there's an enormous bidding world, they just don't. You have to understand something. There's an evil that exists in the business affairs community of Hollywood that is so enormous. It's like an evil cult of lawyers and accountants that are totally there to screw you every way imaginable in this new world and not pay you. Okay? Just remember that. So the only so the money you get paid up front, that's usually money that's real. The money you get from the book publisher in terms of advances and royalties, that's real. But profits on a movie, oh my God. Don't waste your breath. Don't even think about it because now if you become John Grisham or Stephanie Myers, okay, or I forget who wrote The Hunger Games, if you have that kind of clout where you have a global brand that's selling millions of books, uh, you may not get it on your first deal, but you, you could possibly get it on your second or third. But, and I don't know what you're doing. What are you writing? Well, I actually live off my education books, but I'm thinking of branching into commercial fiction. But I, I, I had one option contract a long time ago for a, a, a book I wrote in a nonfiction. And it, it kind of got stalled because once I had a lawyer involved against the movie company, which was a small company in Holland, um, they made it such that it was, it was a much better contract. And of course, the then things just kind of. You know, so the movie. But that's the way it works. Yeah. You can't reinvent City Hall. City Hall. Yes, ma'am. Um, I wonder if the book going to animation works or say cartoon probably television works. Um, if you were to do the same thing with your book, would you have to go through the same thing? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 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 Yes, ma'am.
So the first thing that clicked in my brain is you don't have a snowball's chance in hell. But I didn't say that. I just thought it. And <laughs> forgive my quickness. It's not that I have five thousand times. So yeah. Well, we got to get back to Hillary. What's your name? Rick. Who's Rick? I wrote a couple books about switching. I think I mentioned by that as far as yeah. Well, y y as I try to tell you, I'm going to re-emphasize what I said before, and it may be hard to grasp. The old model was a writer writes a book, finds a literary representative, somebody like me, and I go out and find a publisher. And then I convince the publisher to buy your book, and the publishing would do all the marketing and promotion of your work and take a gamble on Rick. That's the old model. Well, that kind of still exists, except the author, in addition to having the head of a brilliant author, has to have the head of a marketing wizard, the Amanda Hawking head. So you, the authors today have to have two heads, writing genius and marketing genius. And I'm sorry to even say that again. I apologize. It's not my fault, right? I'm a deal maker. I can't sell anything unless there's some, something extraordinary. I just sold two angel books, and the woman that I sold them for gave me this crystal. And uh, I'm very blessed to have this crystal and have her as a client. And I sold them, she used to have a radio show. And every now and then I break the, the rules. It wasn't a big deal. I got $60,000 for two books, but I was real happy. And she was real happy because she wasn't really a writer. She has to hire a writer to write the books for her. But she's an angel. So in this instance, angel power work. Now she wants to do a TV series on angels. Now there's two kinds of angels. There's religious angels and spiritual angels. Now, in my book, it doesn't matter whether or not they're religious or, spangel, uh, or uh, spiritual, as long as they're not dark. So I embrace all angels as long as they're not dark. So I think I've got the religious angels over here and the spiritual angels over here, and they're keeping me floating. Back to who Rick is. Um, unless you're an extraordinary writer, uh, if you're self-publishing your book, and I think that's what you're suggesting. The route that a million people are going right now. Remember, there's probably at least 15 million authors who are going to wake up tomorrow morning and try and figure out how they're going to get published. And some of them are going to wind up contacting me. And I'm going to say to them exactly what I'm saying to you here. You need to figure out who Rick is because Rick has to be as, as equally assailable as Rick's great work.